Mrs. Morris and the Ghost by Tracy Wilton Chapter 13 On her way home, Charlene made a stop at a furniture place that she'd missed on previous drives. It was a little hole-in-the-wall strip mall, but when she entered, the selection of beds took her breath away. The store manager, Thomas Harding, explained that each one of their beds was handcrafted, a dying art. The store had been in existence for over a hundred years, and each brass bed, whether a day bed or canopy, was made one at a time by master craftsmen. Solid brass was more expensive than iron or steel, as the material was soft. It could have been just a great sales pitch, but Charlene fell in love with a gorgeous canopied queen-size bed made of brass with ivory net. Then she ordered a king-size sleigh bed in walnut with a matching armoire and writing desk. Her last bed to buy was another brass frame and headboard. She'd cover her side tables with lace so that everything went together. The suites would give her place the distinction she wanted as the most elegant bed and breakfast in Salem. Mr. Harding assured her they would be delivered the following week. By the time Charlene arrived home, the house was in darkness, silent and eerie. She turned on the radio and hit the bright lights before hanging up her coat. Jack? She entered the kitchen, hoping to find him seated at his chair. Unofficially, it belonged to him, and she always took the one to the right. She was disappointed to see the seat empty. Jack! Come out, please. Finding that store, even though she'd spent more than she should, gave her a feeling of accomplishment. She wanted to celebrate with Jack. They'd become allies since she'd moved in. Jack! Jack! Where are you, Jack? I bought beds, beautiful beds, and now all the rooms will be filled. She walked to the basement and flipped on the light. You down there, Jack? Nothing. She closed the door again. Silence. She tried a different tactic, one that might get his interest up. Oh, and I've just met a friend of yours, Brandy. We had a long talk, and I want to tell you about it. No matter how hard she'd tried to bring the conversation with Brandy back around to whom Jack might have had an affair with, the timing never seemed right. She strolled into the living room, which had three separate seating areas, and one day soon would be filled with guests. She sat on the sofa facing the mantel and mirror, cocking her head to see if Jack was correct. It looked centered perfectly to her. Had he fixed it, or had it been fine from the start? Come on, Jack. Don't be mad. Shauna and Theo's affair was the worst-kept secret in Salem. How to ask him if he'd remained faithful? Was it possible that his mistress killed him when he'd refused to divorce his wife? Still nothing. Not a whisper or a sound. It made her feel all alone and lonely in this big house. Her feeling of euphoria burst like a balloon. Perhaps she should have gone for dinner with Sam after all. Sitting here talking to a ghost was not conductive to healing her broken heart and building a life without Jared. It only made the ache worse. There wasn't anything she didn't want to share with him. If he were here, they'd laugh over Brandy calling herself a witch. They'd probably be sipping Merlot right now, celebrating this exciting new adventure in their lives. Ghosts? Witches? Fascinating new people? Wonderful beds to try out? Oh, Jared, why couldn't you be Jack? Please come back and haunt me. For a night? For a day? She sniffed and wiped away a tear. She felt a sudden chill. Jack? Not Jack, but the cat, eyeing her from behind one of the love seats. He pounced, landed beside her on the couch, and pushed his head under her arm. Giving in, she scratched behind his ear, petting his silky fur. You are a beauty, aren't you? So, who's your owner? We can find out tomorrow whether or not you've been chipped, and just maybe I can return you back to your family. The cat arched his back, sticking his face into her hand. You are a clever one, waiting until I'm alone and feeling sad, then you push yourself onto me. Have you no shame? She continued to stroke the soft fur. 
It will be nice to know your name. Can't keep calling you Cat, now can we? His golden eyes blinked. Okay, let's see. She paused and thought. Something regal. Ordinary won't do it for you. She lifted the cat's face, searching his eyes. The cat blinked and blinked again. He tossed his head, stretching his neck, as if to say, Yes, I'm not only royal, but this palace is my home. Okay, how about noble? Do you like that? The cat yawned. That's no. How about diamonds? Charlene touched his red with silver studs collar. You and your bling. The cat licked her hand. Am I getting closer? How about if we call you bling? The cat meowed, hopped down, and pranced off to the kitchen in search of food. Charlene got up and followed the cat. The questions about Jack's life and death and the mystery about the cat made her crazy. It would be good to find some answers. And since Jack was a no-show, it seemed the cat was a better bet. She opened a can of chopped chicken breast and poured half into the cat's food bowl, then grabbed a fork and ate the rest. Wasn't the finest dinner in the world, but after the wine tasting and the crackers and cheese, it was enough. She was tired, deflated, and went to bed early, dressed for the autumn night in flannel PJs. Despite the spinster attire, her mind floated with vivid dreams of both Sam and Jack. Patient Sam and Flighty Jack were a handful even in her bed at night. Seemed like Sam was not so patient after all. Matter of fact, he'd been quite all over her, and she hadn't minded a bit. Jack, sweet, sweet Jack, had consoled her tears after Sam left. Then he kissed her, the most beautiful kiss in the world. In the morning, after a wild and restless night, Charlene shuffled to the kitchen with a yawn and got out the coffee. No ghost in her kitchen or the dining room. Stop playing games, Jack. Charlene put on a pot of French roast and pressed the start button of her Keurig machine. She'd ordered a large coffee maker for the dining room once she was open for business, which was in the butler's pantry and out of the way for now. I mean it. If you want me to solve the mystery of your death, I'd appreciate a little cooperation. When he didn't appear, she popped an English muffin into the toaster and fried up an egg. She purposely sat down in Jack's chair with her breakfast and half expected that he'd kick her off, but unfortunately his presence was gone. Had he successfully crossed over? Would she never see him again? She refused to sit here and mourn of the loss of a ghost, not when there was so much to do before her party. Better to be proactive instead of sitting around moping. She retrieved pen and paper from the drawer next to the refrigerator to make a list for the day. But instead of writing down things to be done, she made a circle of possible suspects or people known to Jack. Shauna took the center, then her new hubby Theo. She added Brandy's name, too, who had said herself that Jack was attractive. The woman knew a lot about wine. Could there be a connection? Jack, Theo, and Brandy rather than Shauna? The three of them had deep Salem roots. Shauna would be the outsider. She tapped the pen on the table, her mind flickering to everyone she'd recently met, or who might have had access to the house. Then she scrawled Parker's name. Not that he had a reason to kill Jack, but he might have seen something, and remained unaware of its importance, or at the time had thought it was of no significance. Despite his taciturn appearance, he was a hard worker and willing to pitch in with basic problems like the mirror. He hadn't gossiped about Jack and Shauna, but he had been in the house the days before Jack's death. Jack had heard him and Shauna arguing. Was it just over the project? Both Will and Jack agreed that Parker's work was excellent. She crossed his name off the list. Who else knew Jack? His patients, of course. Fellow doctors? Jack had said he'd bought his own building and leased it. Did Shauna still own it? Ernie could help her. She picked up her phone and found his number. Since he didn't like taking her phone calls, she sent him a text, letting him know she'd stop by his real estate office sometime tomorrow afternoon. Maybe Ernie would know what happened to Jack's practice after his death. And maybe, being in the real estate business, he could explain how Theo got all of the acreage for the vineyard. 
He didn't answer her. She put his name under the suspect's list. She'd try once more to call Shauna, and if the woman didn't answer, Charlene would drop by her art gallery. There would be answers today. Charlene then scheduled a morning appointment for the cat at Vinny's veterinarian, which made her think of a certain gorgeous detective. Sam. Perhaps she didn't want him to be patient. Last night had proved that she didn't want to spend her evenings alone. She needed friends, of both the male and female variety. And although she was still working to get the house together and trying to solve the mystery of Jack's untimely death, she was eager to fill this mansion with people. Maybe Minnie would come in for a few hours this afternoon and help with all the details for the big party. Since this was Charlene's first event, it presented a wonderful opportunity to make herself known in this community. A lot depended on a successful outcome. Excited now about her prospects, she went into her bedroom to shower and dress, choosing khakis and a maroon pullover to tackle the full day ahead. Brown liner on her eyes, a golden brown on her lids, and a touch of mascara, then a light blush and pink lipstick to add color to her pale complexion. Jared had always said she had a pretty face and didn't need makeup, but since his death she'd gotten thin and she didn't smile as often. What did Sam see when he looked at her? Angry at herself for that thought, she turned away from the mirror. She called Minnie and grabbed a cardboard box to transport the cat to the vet. Good morning, Minnie. It's Charlene. I know it's short notice, but I wondered if you'd be able to help me this afternoon. I want to hang the curtains in the top floor bedrooms. I have two guests already for Halloween. Can you believe it? A thrill fluttered through her. And we have to plan the menu. I want to bake, and I hope you're good at it, since I tend to burn ice water. Sure, Minnie replied with an easygoing tone. What time would you like me, dear? Let's say two o'clock, and you can leave by five. I know you like to go home to prepare dinner for Will. That will be fine. Not that Will can't take care of himself, but you know how men are. If they can get a woman to take care of their needs, why do it themselves? She chuckled. Not sure if your husband was like that, but my Will sure is. Jared's specialty had been Sunday morning breakfast. Waffles with strawberries and cream or his divine mushroom omelets. She hadn't had one since. Thanks, Minnie. Of course, now that she had the box for the cat and an appointment, the Persian was nowhere to be found, just like Jack. She glanced at the cork board next to the fridge and Sam's card pinned there. To call or not to call? That was the million-dollar question. She slid the card in her pants pocket, deciding she'd wait until after the appointment to call him. Then it could be about the cat, and not about her loneliness or vivid dreams. Jack! Where are you? I'm trying to solve your murder, and you are doing another one of your disappearing acts. Again! What is it with you? You're more magician than ghost, and I'm not amused. The doorbell rang, and she rushed to answer it. Nick! She hadn't seen him since he'd left suddenly yesterday. Come on in! She'd given her cash to Parker. Is it okay if I write you a check for the porch? It looks great. Sure, I never say no to money. He adjusted his New England's Patriots cap and followed her to the kitchen. You've made this look real nice, Charlene. His eyes dropped to the milk dish on the floor next to the cellar door. You still haven't found out where the cat lives? No, Charlene grumbled. I have a vet appointment and he's done a disappearing act. She grabbed her checkbook. Three hundred, correct? That's right. He scrubbed at his bearded jaw, his hair curling past his ears beneath the hat. So, did you think of another job for me? Your kitchen looks fine. Nick slipped his brim up an inch to survey what he could see from the center of the hall. The trim on the stairwell is showing signs of wear, and your dining room is outdated. That collar was popular about ten years ago. The room was quite dramatic, with burgundy paint on the upper half, striped wallpaper at the bottom a heavy mahogany table with eight large chairs in the center. A large frame picture on the end wall displayed a meadow of flowers. I like it, she said, now eyeing it critically. It fits the room. 
I go lighter myself. The furniture is dark, and I think a soft gray would be complimentary, less formal. He gave her an inquiring look. He sounded like he knew what he was talking about, but why fix what wasn't broken? She had given some thought to her bedroom, though. I'll think about it, but come have a look at my bedroom, she led the way. When I first moved in there was a musty smell. It's gone now, but I think a fresh coat of paint might spruce things up. What color? Nick turned around, observing her small love seat. The television in the private living room and her adjoined bedroom, white on white. I was thinking slate. Hmm, yeah. He walked over to the window, removed his hat, and peered closely at the frame before stepping back. Amber would contrast great with the white. I can hang some new curtains if you want. His mouth curved in a half smile. Good looking, that was for sure. What's wrong with these? she asked. They'd been dry cleaned, according to Ernie, before she moved in. White lace. It just looks dated. Well, I'm not a child. I bet you're, what, thirty? Thirty-five? Had ten years and you'd be a lot closer. She wrapped her arms around her stomach, wishing for things that couldn't be. Like Jared at her side. No way. His mouth pressed into a tight line as if he didn't quite believe her. Or he could be flirting. She hoped not. Way. So, I'll look for curtains at the mall, and you can select the paint. Amber for in here, and if you'd bring me some samples while you're at the hardware store of the gray shades, I'll see if there's one I like. But no promises. And I do want you to paint the widow's walk. His face flushed. Will do, Charlene. His turquoise eyes pierced her, and she stepped toward the door, feeling his interest. Why don't we go into town together? You can find your drapes, and I'll get the paint. Then we can have lunch. My treat. He patted his back pocket, where he'd casually stuffed her check. No. Was he hitting on her? I can't. Charlene was at least ten years older than him, and it was hard to tell because of his beard, and besides, she just wasn't ready. I have to get the cat to the vet, meet someone for lunch, and be back here by two. Rain check. No, but thank you. She hid a smile and walked out of the bedroom, headlong into Jack, standing outside her door with a scowl on his too handsome face. Her body broke out in chills. Jack didn't move and gave her a daring grin. I hear you wanted to talk to me. Nick, of course, had no idea that there was a ghost materialized two steps away from him. Jack waved his hand in front of Nick's face, but the painter didn't blink. Jack turned his back on Nick. Go ahead. Talk he teased, knowing that if she did, Nick would think she was nuts. She gestured for Nick to walk ahead of her. How to get rid of him. Fast. He seemed to drag his feet as he crossed the kitchen. Jack pushed in front of Nick, grinning at Charlene as he did a two-step shuffle. The painter was oblivious. Her chin lifted. That ghost was going to get it if he kept this nonsense up. Want me to help you find the cat? Nick asked. Maybe he's in the basement. I can do it, thank you. Listen, I just remembered another engagement. Would you mind terribly picking up a can of the amber paint? She pulled two twenties from her front pocket and handed it to him. We can start tomorrow if that's all right. Jack had a gleam in his eye as he inched a kitchen chair in Nick's path. Nick was looking at Charlene as he stumbled into it. Where did that come from? He muttered with a confused expression. I'm sorry. I'm not sure. She glanced at Jack, who had now seated himself in the chair, making faces at her. No problem. He straightened the chair. I'll grab that can today. Fine, Nick. Charlene bit the inside of her cheek as she practically pushed him toward the door. See you tomorrow. Nine o'clock good for you? Uh, yes, that's fine, but you sure you can't do lunch? You're sure. Jack said from behind her. I'm sure. Bye. She slammed the door behind him, then turned to face Jack. Where have you been? How dare you order me around? What if he'd seen you? Her pulse raced. Nobody sees me. That's the problem. 
he swept her with a flourish. I'm dead. She tried to brush past him, but he stood in her way. She could walk through him, but that just seemed rude. Would you muss me if I was gone? His face was inches away from her. Her heart hammered in her chest. The words hung between them. She shrugged. Yes, probably. You annoy the heck out of me, but I've gotten used to you coming and going. He gave her a long, slow smile. I'm glad. You shouldn't be. You should be doing everything in your power to leave and go where you belong, wherever that is. The cat twined between her legs and she jumped backwards, scooping the fur ball into her arms. Got you. We are going for a little ride. Where? Jack questioned. Since his back in place, she found the cardboard box and placed the cat inside. He yowled. Jack stepped in front of her. What are you doing, Charlene? He can see me. Please don't get rid of him. And what good does that do? She sighed and bowed her head at his stricken expression. I'm sorry. Sam suggested that the cat might have a microchip, which means we can track his owner and return him. Jack looked as if she was banishing his best friend. Jack, you know we can't keep him. I asked you to help me. This doesn't feel like help. What do you want me to do? I can't keep someone else's pet just because the cat notices when you are around. You can't even scratch his ears. Thanks for the reminder. Jack disappeared in an electric flash, sapping all of the new light bulbs in the kitchen.